everyone. Thank you for join, joining us today. I will give a few minutes for everyone to go ahead and join the Zoom webinar. I can see the numbers going up. We're at 175 participants. 230. Let's see if we can get to 400. <laughs> We're at 290. 291. All right, things are slowing down a bit. So we will go ahead and begin our presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the assessor's office today. My name is Angelina Romero. I am the chief communications officer at the Cook County Assessors. Ooh, we are at 301 participants. I will be giving you these live updates. This is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to introduce everyone here today. Uh, just a second. Let me share my screen. All right. All right. Can you verify you can see my screen? Yes. Okay. Perfect. I can see your screen. All right. So you are joining us here today for the Cook County Assessor's Office our annual practitioners meeting for 2023. I'll go ahead and, oh, let's see. That is not moving here, one second. There we go, okay. So our presenters today, we have Christina Lynch. She is the director of legal. We have Gina Math Matheson, our legal counsel. Michael Piper, our Chief Valuations Officer, they will be presenting today. Um, and then we have myself, I'm the moderator, and we also have uh, two other colleagues joining us that will be in the chat. We have Tasha Gibbons and Tia Giacalone. So they will be answering all of the questions in the chat box. So with that in mind, we will go over just a few um, housekeeping rules so that everyone is aware. During the presentation, you can go ahead and post questions inside the chat box. As I said, we have colleagues here that will go ahead and be monitoring that and answering your questions live. Uh, towards the end of the presentation, we'll go ahead and sort through all the questions, see if there's duplicates, see which ones we can answer, uh, any that really uh, stand out, things that we didn't really touch on during the presentation, we will go over Q&A at the end. And just to reiterate, we are going over the new rules, the appeal rules for 2023, all the major changes that are taking place and also the new class change rules. Um, additionally, we will be going over, this is brand new, but guidelines for filing appeals. So this is sort of our best practices, um, tips to share with you. And as I stated at the end, actually of this presentation, um, we will go ahead and email everyone out the um, access to the slides, follow-up information, and you will have access to this recording. It will actually live on our website, so you can revisit that. All right, so we'll go ahead and hop into it. Thank you, Angelina. Um, and uh, thank you to my great panel of co-presenters here. We had a really fun little collaboration to bring this to you guys today. And thank you all of you for being here. We can't see you, but it sounds like there's a sea of people out there listening. So uh, I'm gonna jump right into our general uh, appeal rules regarding filing and evidence submissions. And these <clears throat> um, are important, of course, uh, each and every one of them. Uh, so the assessor's office incorporated some new clarifications that are regarding evidence to support a successful, a successful appeal and certificate of error filing. Um, these new rules this year also include additional information on how to report factual errors to the, to the assessor's office, which will help a lot of you as in we, you know, sometimes there are factual errors and we want to fix what we can. Um, the big rule addition this, this year is uh, covering class change requests, which uh, Michael Piper, our chief valuations officer, will get into and, and explain to you all. The appeal rules are designed, of course, to provide clarity, fairness, and promote accurate assessments and not to create stumbling blocks for taxpayers or representatives. We want this to be clear, fair, and transparent to everyone um, and fairly applied. Um, so next slide. Thanks, Angelina. 
so rule number four um, is appeals should generally be filed through SmartFile. Rule four provides additional contact information and suggestions for taxpayers who might not have reliable internet access. We get that maybe not everybody has it. Um, and we, in order to kind of fill this, fill this gap in and some during peak times, the assessor's office has new self-help sta stations available in the office. Um, and peak time would include something like the second installment tax, pe uh, tax period. Um, rule four also provides uh, that it's unacceptable to email an appeal to any individual assessor employee in lieu of using SmartFile. This is, of course, again, to promote fairness um, and uh, generally a rule that applies to everybody in the same way. Rule 18 um, is uh, notes that all appraisals submitted to the assessor's office in support of an appeal should and or must comply with use PAP standards. Um, the, the main rule, the first standard rule of use PAP standards are that appraisals must be credible. They shouldn't be biased. Um, they should provide a well-supported estimate of value rather than simply being a vehicle to request a lower assessed value on the property. And they should be dated within the triennial appeal period being appealed. Appraisers, like any other professional in an industry, are held to uh, an ethics standard. And the ethics rule in the use PAP standards says that an appraiser must promote and preserve the public trust inherent in the appraisal process practice by observing the highest standards of professional ethics. And of course, as I stated, it means to not perform an assignment with bias, um, not advocate the cause or interest of any party or issue. Um, there are other rules in here, but we wanted to just highlight some of these for you um, and highlight in general that these ethics rules are important um, to, the, to the standard and practice uh, of practice for appraisers in the industry. Uh, rule number 19 is uh, provides more clarification regarding evidence submitted supporting valuation arguments based on income. So this also adds a redaction requirement for non-public personal information. Um, it's important that this information be redacted. Um, it's important to not risk the private information or personal information of your clients um, because once it's submitted to our office, it becomes public record and subject to a FOIA request. Um, the information that should be redacted are social security numbers, employee identification, employer identification numbers, driver's license numbers, financial account numbers, and credit and debit card numbers. The purpose of the rule, of course, is to, again, protect your client's personal information because it is public once it hits our, hits our system. And now um, rule 20 continues to be our uh, vacancy rule and talk about the types of evidence that we would like to see in uh, vacancy appeals. Specifically this year, we are adding that we would like to see color photographs dated during the assessment year under appeal of both the interior and exterior of the building. What you wanna do is lead the analyst through the property. Like, you know, maybe just start front of the building, go through the front door, just take photos as you go through uh, both interior and exterior. What um, we are getting a lot is a Google Maps photo that maybe shows, you know, five buildings or shows maybe a house that's behind a tree or something. And that makes it difficult for the analyst to evaluate your complaint. Um, we know that sometimes your clients don't always know how to send you a photograph that maybe has a date on it. And so feel free to use our general attestation form, which we introduced last year for that purpose. You know, just the attestation. I am so-and-so. I took the dates on the, I took these photos on this date. It shows the property. I mean, it doesn't have to be anything really um, complicated. And also just so you know, our vacancy policy, which was originally published in May, 2020 and updated in May, 2021 is still in effect. The rule links to the vacancy policy so you can always find it easily. The key to the vacancy policy is that vacancy is limited to no more than 24 months due to any individual event. Uh, rule 23 uh, talks about 
arguments that a property should be valued as common area. Uh, what we see a lot of is we get a maybe an affidavit of use, but not really anything else other than an assertion that it should be common area. What we would like to see is the declaration and amendment declaration or amendment to the declaration designated the property as common area. Usually this document will have the legal description of the common area, which is something usually clever like out lot A or lot five or something like that. The deed to the association and the affidavit of use is still helpful. So if you normally prepare that, please continue to do so. Uh, sometimes we know that a common area might be um, might be set through more complex means. So just give us the documentary evidence so that we can look at it, things like plats, dedications, or other green agreements as needed to show that it is common area. Uh, this is not really, this is not in the rules, but it is a note on uh, square footage arguments for, for land. Our, our office does not independently validate land square footage for any pin. Rather, we verify the land square footage, footage of any pen with the Cook County Clerk's Office records, which should be identical to all county resources, but sometimes it is not. Therefore, our office can only grant an appeal based on changes in land square footage if we find that our data does not match the Clerk's Office data. If you find that the uh, land square footage for your pen is not matching maybe your survey or something like that, please take those, please take those to the Cook County Clerk's Office Mapping Department, which keeps records of the land measurement for each pin. Of course, land valuation and class changes and things like that are handled by the assessor and should be given to our office. Things such as farmland pricing, excess land, common area, class changes from commercial to maybe a 241, those are handled by our office. And as usual, please, so um, supply any um, documented, documentary evidence in support of your arguments for land valuation. Uh, rule 26, we are still not accepting re-reviews of our valuation decisions. If you have a difference of opinion regarding the valuation given by our office post appeal, you can always file a further appeal with the Cook County Board of Review. However, if you see that there is a factual error in our assessment, we do want you to reach out to our office so that we can uh, review and correct these. These are things such as classification, proration issues, uh, square footage of uh, buildings, key punch errors, uh, missing incentives. Sometimes you might unfortunately see maybe an extra zero in something. That's obviously human error. Please let us know about things like that. Or if we have something assessed as like, say, a house on a lot, but you know that there's only an empty lot, please let us know about that too so we can get that corrected. And Rule 26 does provide methods to contact our office regarding the correction of factual errors in an assessment. Uh, rule 28 continues to be for certificates of error this year. And of course, you can still file certificates of error either within or outside of the appeal process. Uh, certificates of error should always be supported by evidence in support of your argument, just like with an appeal. So please see um, the appeal rules 13 through 25 for guidelines on the types of evidence. And um, please note rule 28 also states that it is unacceptable to email your certificate of error request to any uh, assessor employee in lieu, of, in lieu of using smart file if you're filing a certificate of error with your appeal or um, in lieu of emailing assessor online appeals uh, if you are filing a standalone certificate of error. And then uh, for pro se filers, the paper filing is still acceptable. And with that, uh, our next big rule we're gonna talk about is class changes. And I'm gonna turn this over to Mike Piper. Thank you, Gina. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Once again, my name is Michael Piper. I'm the Cook County Assessor's Office Chief Valuation Officer. I'm gonna to talk to you about a few things. Um, the first one, we call it the big one, the big change request is the Rule 25. The point of this is to give you an idea of what types of evidence we're looking for when you're filing an appeal or a certificate of error based on a class change. Uh, lots of times we'll get appeals in in which someone's 
filing for market value revision or this uniformity argument. Uh, oh, and by the way, class change, please specifically state, so in your appeal materials, if part or all of this appeal is about class change, okay? And this rule update is also going to apply to the class five change request. Class five is what primarily non-incentive on commercial properties to one of the mixed use classes, 318 or 212. So and other class, including incentive classes, other class changes are also addressed by rule 25. So for class changes within class two, okay? And if you don't remember anything, but one thing about this part of the presentation, write this down, provide clear color photographs, okay? They make a big difference to us. Dated during the assessment year of the appeal of both the inside and outside of the building. That makes a difference to us because, you know, if we get 100,000 appeals, we cannot go out to 100,000 properties. So you're helping us help you. Any type of floor plans you have available, surveys or appraisals, uh, all will help. The square footage, anything you know about the actual building itself, um, there's no way we're going to get the square footage unless we come out or you send that to us. Um, if you can, provide the total number of rooms, the breakdown of the bedrooms, bathrooms, and half baths, okay? So we'll walk a little bit about the class changes and the different classes of class two. For class change requests to class 211, we need you to provide evidence that each unit is actually used for residential purposes, not you know, just something that somebody threw a bed and a couch in, but actually used as a separate entrance, um, separate utility meters. There's no other reason unless someone has an apartment or something upstairs that you're going to have a separate utility meter. So that makes a big difference. Copies of leases, detailed rent rolls, they're all recommended. Class 212 is, uh, as you know, a smaller mixed-use building where there's some residential and some commercial use of six units or less. So we're looking for, in order to qualify, we're looking for the non-residential portion to be not just non-residential, but commercial, not industrial, commercial. The residential portion of the building must actually be used for residential purposes, as we just said, and the residential units need to be zoned for residential use either legally conforming or legally non-conforming. So what kind of evidence are we looking for? Once again, there's that phrase, a clear cut of color photograph dated during the assessment year, that'll help. Any floor plans, surveys, appraisals, a lot of these themes you'll see uh, repeated throughout the presentation because this is the evidence that our analysts are looking for. Uh, evidence that each unit, each residential unit is actually used for residential purposes, has a separate entrance and has separate utility meters. Because really what you're trying to see is something that we already know as a class five is commercial use. You want us to know about what the residential use. So um, copies of leases, detailed rent rolls, and the rent roll is important because in that rent roll, you're going to have tenant names on it. And then you're going to have some holes where there is no tenant because you know, it's vacant. So if it's part of it is vacant, we want to see that. Provide evidence that it's been used for residential purposes previously and also list the current rental listings for vacant residential units. And again, most important thing, we need evidence that the residential units are zoned for residential use, either legally conforming or legally non-conforming. So remember that phase of clear color photographs, dated photographs. Okay, we have a our first poll for the day, okay? There's three pictures here. And uh, a lot of you are saying, well, they're all colored pictures and they all have dates on them. Okay, which one of these pictures is unacceptable as part of your appeal when you send it to the assessor's office? There's three, which one? Photo one, photo two, or photo three? One of them is not acceptable. You can vote. Um, Angelina, you wanna put that up? Yep, so I went ahead and put it up. Can, I don't see anyone putting in results. Can you guys see it on your end? I don't see it. I don't see it. Let me relaunch the poll. Here we go. There it is. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Okay. Ooh, a Remember, lot of 
We got one bad one and two good ones. Boy. Also, by the way, we have reached 401 participants. Wow, excellent, excellent. Mm -hmm. Great turnout. So you guys are right. You hit it right on the money, most of you. Um, photo number one, and what makes this not acceptable to us? Well, this is not a picture someone took. This is a Google download. And it says the word, I think it says Google on there. If you see that, mm -hmm. we see it. That's not a picture you took. The ones, the other two, someone took. And they have the date, by the way, of February of 2023. This other picture, that Google picture was from three, four years ago. So that's not doing us any good. Okay. Yeah. So we have Thanks one, you. let's see, uh, 206 people voted photo one. I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Seven people said photo two, nine, nine of you said photo three. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay, so I shared the poll, you guys can see that. And next slide. Oh. Okay, so uh, just resuming where we left off with our mixed use properties, 318 is a building measuring between 20,000 and 99,999 square feet used primarily for residential, totaling seven units or more with residential apartments and commercial area. Okay, so if you're looking for uh, a 318 classification, and this is important, the commercial component of the property should consist of no more than 35% of the total rental square footage. So I got a calculator. Let's say this building is 90,000 square feet, okay? Um, meets all the other criteria, but 10,000 of that is hall, laundry room, non, nothing that can be rented out, okay? 35% of 90,000 is not the number you're looking for. You're looking for 35% of what? 90,000 minus 10,000. So it would be 35% of 80,000. So that's approximately 28,000 square feet would have to be um, that with the, the maximum of commercial. That makes sense, okay? It's the denominator is the thing that's very important. It's 80,000, not 90,000 here. So for those buildings where the commercial portion exceeds 35% or the building exceeds 99,999 square feet, the building will instead be subject to a split class, commercial five downstairs and maybe commercial two or three in the upper floors, so if that makes sense, okay? Yep. Okay, so what evidence are we looking for? Uh, I'm gonna skip that first one because I think you guys have heard that enough, but color photographs, <laughs> floor plans, surveys, appraisals, any type of documentation similar to that, uh, evidence that each residential unit is actually used for residential purposes and being used could be, by the way, that it's vacant, but you, you know, you have something that you've marketed through Zillow or one of the other uh, real estate um, companies that market these properties. We look at that, copies of leases, uh, up-to-date leases, detailed rent rolls. If the residential portion of the building is vacant, provide evidence that it's been used for residential purposes previously, and also current rental listings for vacant residential units. Income evidence has specified in Rule 19 and evidence that the residential units are zoned for residential use, either legally conforming or legally non-conforming. Okay, so finally, um, other class changes not involving incentive classes. Again, we're looking for those clear pictures with the dates during the assessment year, uh, floor plans, surveys, appraisals, and I know uh, you've heard some of this before, um, but this, these are important things to us because when the analyst sees your appeal, you don't want them to have to guess, okay? Um, I'm going to uh, let you take a look at that website down at the bottom because this, that's the most important thing about this. You can see all the other rules having to do with class changes uh, to incentive classes at www.cookcountyassessor.com slash incentive special properties. Uh, I'm going to turn the next part over to Christine. She's going to talk about some additional um, updates to the appeal guidelines. Thank you, Michael. Uh, all right. This is brand new for 2023. 
Um, we have these great guidelines for you guys. How exciting. <laughs> Uh, it's how to file appeals. We just figured we kind of kind of go through some of the things that we see, things that we think will be helpful to all of you and, uh, and your clients uh, and as you're navigating this process and filing appeals with our office. Um, we want to, you know, we want to help you submit the highest quality um, appeals you can and also um, for your client, but also for us and for our analysts as we, you know, we do, we do get a large volume of appeals in the office and we'd like to We'd like to make the process smooth for everybody. Um, it's, it's intended, of course, to help everyone, like I just said, and um, ensure that the filings are clear and concise and supported by all the right evidence and arguments. Um, and this is not just for appeals, but of course, it applies to certificates of error as well that we process that will be you know, uh, useful to, to all of us as well. Next slide. So the general guidelines, first and foremost, read the rules. I mean, you know, as uh, I mean, as lawyers, you know, we are all I think we all are told uh, when we first start practicing that we should be reading the rules, especially if we're litigators. Not everyone's a litigator, but, you know, there are there are rules that we all have to follow as lawyers in, in, in a courts of law or or other similar forums. So reading the rules is important before you file. It just ensures that you fully understand what we uh, what we've put out there, what we're looking for. Uh, the documentation that we need. Uh, and, you know, when you file using our smart file application, you'll be certifying that you've reviewed the appeal rules. So make that true. <laughs> next slide. Uh, general guidelines. Next one is um, legible and complete. This is so important. I can't tell you how important this is. Um, and thank you to Gina Matisson for making this a really big uh, front and center rule for our uh, office going forward. Uh, everything really should just be legible. We've already, uh, Michael, you know, Michael Piper has already mentioned several times about how clear photo, you know, clear color photographs help. They do, they really do. They help us. They, we, we can better see what the property, what the subject property looks like. Um, we need it to see that it's dated. Um, it's very hard for our analysts to reasonably review something that's not legible. Um, and we, you know, and, it, and it's also, it's hard for us to have to be chasing down legible copies. <laughs> so uh, you can obtain legible copies uh, from, you know, say, uh, for example, closing documents from the title company or the real estate broker. Uh, everything that you submit should also be complete, not just legible, but complete. Analysts can't review a document or evaluate it appropriately if it's incomplete. Um, again, same thing. You can you can obtain complete copies of uh, closing documents, for example, from your title company or the real estate broker that was involved in the transaction. Recorded documents can be obtained from the clerk's office. They have this great online application now where you can go and just pull a PDF of an unofficial document, um, although recorded documents, of course, um, official recorded documents are, um, are highly or are strongly encouraged as well. <clears throat> Next pop quiz. <laughs> is this legible? <laughs> or is it kind of? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me launch this one. <laughs> Oh, can you guys see the poll happening? Yes. Right. yes. Okay. Well, it is asking, is this a real example? I mean, this particular one I did create, but it's based on many, many, many documents we see, particularly your closing statement, which is all smeared up all everywhere, often, you know, kind of recorded off to the side so you can't see everything. So we're just asking that everybody please review those documents before turning in them into us. If you can't read them, we can't either. Okay, so the real answer is technically, it, no, it is not a real example, but it portrays example, yes. an example of what you receive sometimes. Okay, so 71% is correct. Um, interestingly, 11% said nothing wrong here. <laughs> okay, well. We'll go ahead and end the poll and share the result. All right, we're officially at 412 participants. Awesome. 
Some of us may have better eyes than others, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so redaction. Um, we'll talk about redaction a little bit a little bit again. Uh, documents submitted to our office, of course, should be redacted. Um, for uh, you know, you should be redacting the non-public personal information. Um, don't want to exist exposing or risk exposing your clients to the possibility of identity theft or carelessly handling non-public personal information. Um, again, it becomes public record once it hits our office and um, it is subject to FOIA. And of course, there are there are guidelines or there are rules, I should excuse me, requirements, statutory requirements under FOIA that um, you know that cover uh, personal and private information. And that's an obligation that our office uh, you know, has and uh, will comply with as well. But we do, we would, we'd like to see you guys do. Um, your part as well and help us out. Um, we're not going to redact the documents for you if you ask us. If, it, if, it, if it's subject to a FOIA request, we will complete our obligations under FOIA. <laughs> um, the, the general norm is to just redact all, four, all, all digits except for the last four, but it's better to just redact the entire thing. Um, and it's usually a lot easier that way, I think, but that's a matter of opinion, I suppose. Next. All right, double dockets. This has been a problem. Um, generally, they generally tend to occur. We see them with uh, either condominium filings or um, by errors in entering equity comps into the smart file application. If you represent an individual condominium owner, please check to see if the association is filing an appeal as a whole. Um, if, you, if you're representing an association, make sure that all the unit owners are participating in the appeal. Take care when entering equity comps into smart files so that you don't inadvertently create a new filing for each property submitted as a comp. Um, just be really careful with it as you go through the process in smart files. So, so we don't get those. <clears throat> All right, and then um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this back over to Michael Piper to talk to you guys a little bit more about uh, content, uh, market value, cap rate, income and vacancy stuff. Thank you, Christina, very good stuff there. Um, so um, this first, sentence here, the better the argument for a change in valuation is presented, the higher the likelihood of success. I'm going to say it one more time. The better the argument for a change in valuation is presented, the higher the likelihood of success. Okay. Make sure that the analyst looking at the appeal does not have to guess. Make sure you're filing on behalf of the correct party. If it's not on the right party, they're not going to issue a change to someone who they're not even clear who owns the property, who are you filing for, okay? The argument should be clear, complete, and succinct. Create, a, and we call it a map of your argument with clearly labeled headings. Tell us what you want. Like, you know, like uh, Cooper Gooding said in the Jerry Maguire movie, uh, show us the money. Tell us what you want. Don't make the analysts guess at what it is you're looking for. And we talked about that before with class change arguments, okay? If your argument turns on a small portion of a large document, and that large document is a couple hundred pages, you want to point out that relevant portion in your brief, okay? And it would maybe be better just to send that portion with the surrounding language. Now, uh, when I look at an appeal, uh, I usually have two piles of evidence that I'm looking at. So there's one with a lot of explanation points and protest statements concerning the unfairness of property taxes and letters of uh, protests regarding the Cook County Assessor's Office appeal rules, they're fine. They go in one pile, but they're no substitute for the well-organized argument for the valuation change to be made. Supporting documentation, nothing beats that. So for valuation appeals and certificates of error, the filer should state their opinion of the fair market value of the property. That needs to be on there somewhere. It should be front and center. It should be based on a realistic valuation analysis. So um, double check the accuracy of the math, okay? Show the math in an organized fashion, like we said before, a map, step one, step two, the bottom line. For value, and this is typically with commercial properties, for valuation arguments based on the income capitalization approach, use reasonably market-derived cap rates, expense ratios, and vacancy and collection percentages. And this should go without saying, but it's unacceptable to inflate expense ratios and or cap rates. If I see uh, 
property taxes reflected in the expenses and also reflected in a loaded cap rate, you've double dipped. Don't do that. We've, do you think we've ever seen that before? Lots of times. We've seen it enough to recognize it. You want to stay away from that as being part of your argument. Okay, so make sure your vacancy filings, and this is important, and Gina talked about vacancy earlier. Uh, vacancy filings, make sure they're organized, complete, and accurate. And we have a vacancy policy on the website. You can consult that, but that has not really changed much. Again, you want to submit actual photographs of the subject property rather than what we saw earlier, Google picture. Um, that does occur. We see it all the time. Before Google and the internet, people would send us newspaper pictures and magazine pictures. And, you know, it's ineffective. Rent rolls should be complete with rental amounts, tenant names, and unit numbers. If the property is being actively marketed for lease or sale, provide legible copies of the marketing agreements and sale and or sale and lease advertisements. If a vacancy was due to a casualty event like, you know, an earthquake or flood or fire, natural disaster, God forbid, provide those details such as the date of the event and when it caused the damage and the documents like an inspection report to support that. Okay. Those are those make a difference. And I, we, we kind of mentioned that as an exception to what we were talking about in this last statement. So in the Cook County Assessor's Office vacancy policy, generally only 24 months, two years of vacancy reductions will be granted for any one qualifying event. Okay, um, Gina, last part, turn it over to you to talk about the guidelines uh, for filing appeals uh, for certificates of error. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so we find that many certificates of errors are based on uh, a tax year that's previously been appealed to either our office, the Board of Review, or even PTAP. While it's the filer's choice as to the form for the appeal, um, there are implications for each choice. And then uh, for this discussion, please note that it only regards the valuation type arguments. It doesn't include certificates of error for homeowner or senior type exemptions for those types of exemptions, uh, if, you're, if the taxpayer qualifies and the certificate of error is timely filed, we will review it, consider it, and if the taxpayer, uh, if the taxpayer is eligible, we will go ahead and apply it. So please note that the, those types of certificate of errors are not what we're talking about here. Um, for those, for those uh, certificate of errors, where the tax year was previously appealed in front of our office, either via a current year appeal or through a certificate of error request, a new certificate of error is going to be less likely to be successful unless there's information uh, regarding an error provided, such as in you know, building square footage, building characteristics, pen prorations, uh, classification, or key punch transcription errors. If the certificate of error request concerns the application of an incentive, so you know, please go ahead. If you if you if an incentive is missing and your client is eligible, please go ahead and file that. Or if there was evidence provided to show the property was substantially damaged by a casualty event, you know, your fire, flood, some other kind of natural disaster, or was demolished. And we also see a lot of certificate of errors where the valuation was previously appealed in front of the Board of Review. These are also going to be less likely to be successful, again, unless there's substantial information regarding an error was made, such as, again, proration, square footage, classification, key punch errors, um, again, for the application of an incentive, or again, um, if the property was substantially damaged by a casualty event or has been demolished. Additionally, and I think a lot of practitioners don't really know this, if we do go ahead and grant a certificate of error for a, on a property where the tax year was previously uh, appealed in front of the board, the board of review also has to agree to that certificate of error. So if, you know, if we grant, if we recommend it, we have to send it up to the board of review for them to review and endorse. And they are not obligated to endorse it so please keep that in mind that um, that it's going to go to the board of review as well, and that 
per the property tax code, only our office can send that upstairs. If you all may not uh, file a certificate of error with the Board of Review. Finally, we do see um, we do see certificates of error for tax years that were previous that are either pending with PTAB or have been even previously decided by PTAB. Uh, the general provisions of the property tax code work to prohibit a dual remedy from both PTAB and a certificate of error for the same year. Um, generally, if you are dissatisfied with a PTAB decision, you should file a a complaint for administrative review with either the circuit court or the appellate court, depending on the amount that in dispute, per section 16195 of the property tax code. A certificate of error with the assessor's office is not the proper forum to, pro, to appeal a PTAB decision. Therefore, barring extraordinary circumstances, our office will deny the certificate of error request for a tax year which is currently pending at PTAB or which has already been decided by PTAB. Uh, and again, this doesn't apply to your homeowners or seniors exemptions. Those are, those are separate and different. And these rules that apply to PTAB also apply to court decisions. If you have a court decision from your tax ob objection case giving a valuation of the property, um, the proper way to appeal any dissatisfaction of that is not to file a certificate of error request. It's to go on to go on up through the court system. And um, a note regarding the reductions in assessed valuation of 100,000 or more for, um, by a C of E is that if we recommend, if we do recommend a, um, a reduction like that, we will have to send it to the circuit court to be adjudicated. And again, only our office may do that. Uh, practitioners and taxpayers may not do so. Uh, finally, there's a lot of uh, myths and misconceptions about the deadlines for filing certificates of error or for issuing certificates of error. It's not infinite uh, and it's not simply the last three years. It's actually based on the date of the annual tax sale. So per the property tax code at section 1415C, no certificate of error other than a certificate to other than a certificate to establish an exemption under section 1425, 14-25, which is um, your property tax exemption, such as for churches and municipalities, shall be executed for any tax year more than three years after the date on which the annual judgment and order for that tax year was first entered. So if you wanna know what the deadline is for certificate of error, look up that year's tax sale and then add three. And now um, I'm going to turn this over to the general question and answer session. Okay. Um, one second, we'll leave that here. All right, we have quite a few questions. Most of them have been answered by those in, um, by our staff in the chat box. So I will just point out a few, let's see. Oh, this is an interesting one. Will the assessor ever be able to take videos for vacancy instead of photos? Um, and, and Tasha and uh, Tia, you can chime in here or I can simply read them whatever you're comfortable with, but uh, Tasha replied, currently the CCA system, we are not accepting videos. Um, the Cook County Bureau of Technology prohibits the upload of external videos based on the county IT security policy. But that's interesting that you say that video. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it sounds like a good idea, but we can't do it currently. I don't know if or when that will change, but that's where we are right now. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, let's see, another one. Are we able to access these slides? Again, yes, these slides will be available on the appeal rule page. Um, but in addition to these slides, I mean, you can simply download, and they're up there, they're live right now, the appeal guidelines um, that this group went through, and also the new rules. You can actually download the PDF. So it's the same information that's on the PowerPoint. So you can download both. And then hopefully by tomorrow, um, we'll have this video today, this presentation that will also be accessible on the website page that you can access year round if you ever wanted to reference back. Uh, let's see. What is the current 
processing time for standalone certificates of error submitted via email? Hmm. Christina, do you want to take that one? Uh, oh, you... Sorry. Oh, sorry. I lost the, what was it? <laughs> what is, no, no problem. What is the current processing time for standalone certificates of error submitted via email? Uh, well, uh, I mean, we're, we're trying to prioritize certificates of error that, um, you know, the earliest year that we can process at this point, which is 2018, um, we have thousands of certificates of error. And unfortunately, we don't have the best tracking mechanism in place currently. Um, you know, we do uh, often people will send us a list of, of pins that they have at, of outstanding um, outstanding certificates of error and you know we we do you know we do hold on to these lists and our team is 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 trying to get through them um and we don't you know we're we're also building currently a platform that will allow us to better track certificates of error we are hoping to launch it later this year so that it will not only allow you to file certificates of error as a standalone certificate of error outside of the appeals process um you know, you know, using the smart file platform, but also allow you to track it, um, to track what's happening with that appeal and, um, and, and hopefully expedite the process of the processing of certificates of error as well. Um, obviously, the caveats that Gina had already mentioned earlier today about, you know, for certificates of error where re of reductions that are greater than $100,000 in assessed value um, do take a lot longer because they have to be adjudicated by the circuit court. And then any certificates of error where the Board of Review, um, you know, has, has made a decision on value and uh, anything that, uh, you know, we any, any certificate of error would need to go through the Board of Review for their approval as well on those, so. Okay, thank you. And then we have a couple of questions regarding filing let's see, outside of the township deadline. So how do you file a certificate of error through smart file outside of the appeal year process for that township? There's an email address. Uh, what is it? Uh, Assessor.onlineappeals. Assessor yeah, assessor.onlineappeals at cookcountyil.gov. That is the current method for submitting standalone certificates of error. And then, I'm not sure if this is almost the same question, but for certificate of errors, do you have to file within the township deadline? You don't have to. Oh. It's easier to work them that way, but it's absolutely not necessary uh, or required. Okay. Uh, this is the same one. Again, a lot of people are asking about that email address. So assessor.onlineappeals at cookcountyil.gov. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's referenced in the rule too. It's referenced in rule 28. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's see. When do you expect to begin mailing for the South Township's triennial reassessment? I can tell you, we, ex we, expect, we expect to be mailing by the end of the first couple by the end of next week. Um, first couple being I think Riverside, Riverside and Calumet, um, those are the only ones we actually have tentative dates for, and I'm saying the end of next week, um, really going into the, the beginning of the following week, so, but it'll, it'll be within the next week and a half, uh, definitely. Okay, and then here's a question regarding the photo requirement that we talked about. If the Google timestamp is dated within the tax year, will it suffice? I would address again, I think we were pretty clear in our rules and our practitioner guides that what you should be giving us are photographs actually taken of the building um, by either your client or you or somebody to really lead us through the property. Um, what we're seeing too often with the, with the Google photographs is some of you are um, providing pictures of the property next door like we've We've received one, it was an appeal for a doctor's office, but we got a picture you know, of the next door property, which was a bike shop. Not very good. Um, another one, a class change for a, um, for some, a class change request where the first floor was a coffee shop. What we got was a picture, a Google photo picture of a building that had a dress shop. It was a building right next door 
but often these aren't being closely reviewed so that you might not even know that you're, you've submitted a Google photo of the incorrect building. So we would strongly suggest rather than, rather than relying on Google photos is to have your client or maybe someone in your office go and take an actual photo of the building. Okay, thank you. And there are a few questions about just the correspondence, um, people wanting to receive a status of the certificate of errors filed. Uh, what it, what do you recommend in order for them to contact someone or just get a status on the an application? You can always contact our office and ask. However, we are being uh, we do have a lot of requests, particularly long laundry lists. And as I said, we are trying to work through all of these as fast as we can. Um, so, you know, I know that uh, clients don't always want to hear, you know, you need to be patient, but sometimes you have to be patient, but you can always, uh, you can always uh, reach out to us. The uh, rules give you various methods to contact our office. So just use one and um, ask about the status. You can also call us, you can come in, you can email, um, there's the contact us page. So there's, there's several ways to reach out to our office. Okay, and then we have a question about the separate utility meters um, that was mentioned, I believe by Mike. Um, this person says a lot of old buildings in Chicago do not have separate meters, i.e. a single boiler for all units. What's mm -hmm. standard for the office for such buildings? Or I guess what proof do you want them to supplement with? No, that's fair. I mean, if you remember in that part of our presentation, we um, pointed out some things that would be helpful. And you're right, in older parts of the city, you're not going to find separate meters. And there may be one or two additional units uh, on another floor. So again, you want to take pictures, you want to send rent rolls, copies of rent rolls, uh, so we can see that you have residential as well as commercial tenants in the building. All right. Uh, will documents that aren't redacted, will they be rejected by our office? No, we're not going to reject them. But, you know, if you're submitting them, we are simply saying it's a lot easier for you to protect your client's information and a lot easier for us um, to not have that information um, sitting as public record that, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, if I, again, if I were, yes, we, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Gina. So say if I were, say, to hire a property tax attorney to um, appeal my property taxes, I would be, as a client, I think I would be a little upset to find if I found that my uh, social security number was being just included in everything, if my checking account number was being included in everything, and we see these sorts of things. So what you need to do is look at what you're submitting and protect your client's personal information. That's, you know, that's um, for litigation, that would be rule 138. It's kind of the same standard, you know, yep. protect your client's personal information. Yeah, there's also a federal rule about it too. I forget which number it is. Oh yeah, yes. <laughs> this is. is not unusual <laughs> to the practice, um, to uh, the professional practice of law. Um, <clears throat> sorry, go ahead, Angelina. Okay. No, there are a few uh, questions about the redaction. Uh, rent rolls. Are you requesting us to redact tenant names as well? No. Okay. Just personal information you're saying. Correct numbers. Let's see. Um, let's see. There's a question about an assessor recommendation that I'd like to address if I oh, could. Oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Christina. Somebody wrote that we are currently we're not able to file for an assessor recommendation letter to activate at the Board of Review unless we first appeal at the assessor's office. That is not correct. Assessor recommendations are requested um, at our office. And when that occurs, the requirement is, is that the petitioner have filed an appeal at the Board of Review, not with our office. If you want to write assess a recommendation that it is simply an internal procedure that allows our office to make a recommendation in support of your appeal. It's basically evidence in support of your appeal to the Board of Review. Um, most assessor recommendations that we write are for class changes because, cla because the Board of Review has, does not have the authority to make class change requests. Um, and, and in a huge majority of those situations, they are for applying incentives. 
Now, the, the one situation with the, the situation with the incentives is, is that um, if you didn't file an appeal for us to apply your incentive, as has been our practice um, and, and with our office that year, um, we would, you know, say we would supply with, and we didn't apply it, we would supply it with an assessor recommendation. Um, if you, you know, <clears throat> you would want to apply our appeal to the Board of Review if you did not file your appeal with our office as well, because um, that's just the mechanism by which we currently are accepting um, or are currently applying uh, incentive classifications to properties. Um, certificates of correction are different from assessor recommendations, of course, because they are statutory and we have to comply with the deadline set by the Board of Review for complaint filing if that helps at all, hopefully. Okay. Will the 40-day appeal window be returning? No. Yeah, no. If you know you have 30 days to file, that will remain. Let's see. In charge, just trying to fill, sort of fill through these. All of them have been answered, though. We can't go through them all. We only have a few minutes left. Um, but all, for the most part, have been answered. I see 42 have been answered. Um, just another question about 30 day to 40. And no, you have 30 days to file again. Um, OK. There's a question about FOIA, too, about what, what do I do when FOIAs take 12 months? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> FOIAs, of course, should not take 12 months. And in the past, that was um, unfortunately did occur on occasion. Uh, our FOIA response time has gotten better. And you should expect a response within the FOIA guideline, within the FOIA requirements of, under FOIA. If you don't, you can reach out to, um, to myself or someone on our FOIA team. I do see a question about uh, exemption applications opening. That will be later this month for the 2022 tax year. Uh, again, about the calendar that will also be posted pretty soon, the 2023 uh, appeal and assessment calendar. A lot of those, a lot of questions again about exemptions for the 2022 tax year again by the end of the month. Um, those will be, you can uh, file online for those. All right, we are pretty much at the top of the hour. Um, let me close this out one second. Okay, um, here's a QR code, you can scan this. Uh, we do have a public newsletter that goes out. We also have um, all of your emails for everyone who participated today and we will send out a follow-up email it is the information lives on our website, but we will go ahead and um, still send out the appeal guidelines, which was covered today, the new rules, the link to the website, and also a link to this video. But again, you can access it year round at any time on our website. All of this information will live there, should be posted up in just a couple of days, but a lot of it is already there. Um, and we thank you so much for spending your afternoon and lunch hour with us. Uh, we had, yeah, just over 400 participants. So thank you very much. Any last comments? Thank you, everyone. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye.